All right, we're, hey, guys, we're starting a new book, Yay. Exodus. Uh, and it's more than just a Bob Marley song. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's a great song though. It is. But uh, Exodus is one of those books that is at the front end, really exciting. And then as it goes to the back end, you can get, you can get a little lost. Like, why are we talking about all these laws and the tabernacle and all this different stuff? And one of the key things to remember is that the Pentateuch is telling us this big story about how God created everything. And then it zooms down to one family with Abraham and then zooms back out to the nation and how through the nations or through Israel, the nations are a blessing to the world. Um, and so Exodus is telling us this big, huge story. Um, and the focus here is on the formation of the community and the, the central things that the community needs to remember is God's saving work, but then also remembering how God um, focuses the community in on the, the temple or the tabernacle as, a, as the hub for how people are going to interact with the Lord. And so the last few chapters of, um, of Exodus really are going to be focusing in on that tabernacle and it's going to feel redundant, um, but it's important uh, for the people to uh, know God's expectations and his roles there. Um, and so in Exodus, we see great displays of God's power, um, which is something so far in creation and in the judgment on the um, <clears throat> judgment of the flood and Babel and um, even with um, the exile for the Adam and Eve as they get kicked out of the garden. There's like displays of God's power happening um, in the book of Genesis. But this is where we really start to see um, God's uh, miracle working uh, on behalf of the people of Israel, uh, which is going to be a major part of the narrative moving forward. Um, <clears throat> so I have some uh, things, some major themes to, to hold on to. And then I also sent out a, a couple of links um, this afternoon with the, just an overview um, Sunday school guide basically for how mm -hmm. Exodus is broken down. And then those two uh, Bible video or Bible project videos, uh, which are always, their, their, their videos are always great. Um, and so if you haven't had a chance to watch those, I highly recommend those as well. Um, but some of the key themes uh, in the book of Exodus are the God who controls history. And so we're gonna see how he orchestrates events to bring about uh, the fulfillment of his, des his designs for the nation of Israel. Um, and so that's a major piece that is continuing to be developed in Exodus. We also see um, the, just the, I, the theme of God's name. Um, and if we're introduced officially to God's name as Yahweh, um, I am that I am. Uh, and so, we have seen, if, if we were reading through the Hebrew text in Genesis, we would have seen Yahweh uh, referred to, um, but this is where the, the first time where we actually see God introducing himself to Moses, and we'll look at that passage tonight. Um, and the name, the divine name is an important part, um, even though there's some, some debate over what I am that I am really means. How do we translate that? Um, but one of the things to note as you're reading your English Bibles, uh, if you see the Lord uh, and Lord is all capitalized, that is a clue to us as English readers that the text is not just talking about like the sir, like how we might think of as Lord, um, but as God, like Yahweh's divine name, the Lord. Um, because there are going to be other times in the Bible where we'll see Lord, which is in Hebrew is Adonai. Um, and so we'll see Lord, but it's not referring to God. It could just be somebody talking to their, like a servant talking to their master would say, my Lord. 
Um, and so making those things clear. Uh, and then there's also um, some de debate over how we actually pronounce the divine name. Um, because in Hebrew, we don't, the, the Hebrew text that we have, um, it has the, the four letters, which we would call uh, YHWH. Um, and so it has those four letters and then they're, Hebrew is a consonant based language. And then the, there's these dots that would serve as the vowels. Um, and so in our Hebrew text that we have, the vowels are actually um, the same vowels that they would use for Adonai. And so that was a clue to the readers of the text uh, to not speak the divine name going to the, the commandment to not use the Lord's name in vain. And so they would say Hashem, the name, or they would say Adonai instead of actually saying uh, Yahweh or uh, one of the other ways that people have been pronouncing it for you know hundreds and hundreds of years is Jehovah. And so Jehovah and Yahweh, those are the two um, kind of debates, like which is it? And we don't really know for sure. Um, and both are okay. You'd be fine using either one. Um, but uh, just you know, for for your understanding, like I'm going to go with Yahweh. Um, just uh, the the you know the school that I went to, that's how they pronounced it, and so that's how I was trained, and so that's what I'm going to hold on to. So um, we also see another theme in Exodus is that it is the book of the God who remembers. Um, he remembers his covenant with Abraham and the patriarchs, and that leads to his responding to the people of Israel as they cry out to him, um, and which leads to the God who acts in salvation. Uh, the, the different idols and lowercase g gods of the, the Canaanite peoples and, and even Pharaoh and Egypt, like they do not have the power to save. And that is one of the major contrasts that um, Exodus is setting up for us today and for the people of Israel is that God has the power to save people. And so he works for salvation. But you also will see the God who acts in judgment. And so he brings judgment against, um, he brings judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt. But later in the book, we'll also see that he will bring judgment against his own people for their disobedience. Um, as Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai, He's up there for, you know, 40 days and the people, um, while he's up on the temple or up on the mountain, getting the design for the tabernacle, Aaron, the, his brother and the, the priest of the people, he is actually leading them in idol worship, uh, down below as they make the golden calf. And that leads to judgment. And so God's judgment is on the nations like Egypt, but also, um, God's judgment will, be expressed to the, his own people as they act in disobedience. And then we also have the God who speaks is a major theme. So God will speak to, uh, to Moses. God will speak through Moses. But we're also going to see in, um, in the book that God, God will speak to the people. And at the, the, the Sinai event, God speaks directly to the people of Israel uh, from the mountain, and then they send Moses up um, on their behalf. And so that's um, another major theme uh, is God who speaks. So we see in um, the book we, that God is creating a family uh, it, uh, with Israel. And one of the key elements of this family is that they are his, Israel is God's son. And later on in the scriptures, we'll see uh, that he, the, the Lord talks about bringing his son out of Egypt. Um, and when that is first mentioned, that is really about uh, Israel coming out of Egypt. But then we also see that same verse applied to Jesus um, as the son of God. And Jesus' own story parallels the story of the, the nation of Israel as well. And so he comes, he brings him out of Egypt, um, it sends him to Egypt, brings him out of Egypt. Um, so that those are some of the, the themes. And so part of the organization of the, the book, if you, you can look at it as 
three major parts. So you have uh, Israel in Egypt, verses chapters one through uh, halfway through 13, and then Israel at Sinai. So that's 13, 17 through 24, 11, and Israel around the tabernacle, which is uh, 24, 12 through the rest of the book. So those are the three major acts of the book of Exodus. So Egypt, Sinai, tabernacle. And so preparation around how to worship, uh, worship the Lord rightly. Um, so there are a bunch of other ways that you potentially could divide up the book of Exodus, but those are some of the just three major chunks to be looking at. And so we're going to, like I said, we're going to have some some law talk later, we're going to have tabernacle talk, and there's going to be some times where we're just like, are we really talking about the measurements of these things? Um, and the specificity of those commands to, in the building of the tabernacle, uh, I believe that is important for us, not just to like have the Bible trivia, but just to recognize that God cares about these things. But then there's also going to be some elements of the tabernacle where we have some specificity and then some non-specificity. Like there are some measurements that we don't have when we have so many others that is like, why wouldn't we have the height of this when we have the width of it? Um, so, but that'll all come in time, but it starts um, with the names. And that's actually the Hebrew name for, um, for Exodus. It, it, Hebrew books uh, in the Old Testament, they, the names are the first words of the book. And so the, the Hebrew name for Exodus is, these are the names of, um, so that's just a fun little fact. Whereas, and then we get Exodus because Exodus means the way out. Uh, and so X is out and o Odos is road. So the way out um, in Greek. And so that's the Greek word that we get Exodus from. So, so that is kind of a setup for where we're going um, with the book. So let's just jump in to chapter one. Um, and we're going to go through chapter three tonight. Um, and if we are running long, I, I might cut it off a little early. So, or if I might, we might not go all the way through three. So, um, yeah. All right. Let's jump in. Is, uh, Exodus one, verse one. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country." All right, so these are the names. The purpose here for giving this generation again is to tie this book back to Genesis. And if we remember, like Moses is the writer of most of the Pentateuch. Uh, we can have that say that with pretty good confidence. Um, and so he is, uh, Genesis is one huge scroll. And so Exodus would be the next scroll. And so the... It, like design pattern intentionality to say, remember the people we just read about in Genesis, this is the continuation of that very same story. And there's some interesting things going on here with the way that this book starts that echoes back to Genesis. So God's command to the, the man and the woman, Adam and Eve is be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. And here we see, as they're talking about um, the people of Israel in Egypt, they were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied, increased in number, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. And then we also see this interesting comparison to the to Pharaoh. He says to, to the people of Egypt, we must deal shrewdly with the people of Israel. And if you remember the serpent, 
was the shrewdest of the animals in the garden. Um, and so there are some echoes back into the Old Testament um, and to our into Genesis that uh, are helpful for us as we are reading this and we're remembering, oh yeah, these are words that we have heard before and they are clues to us, like when, with the Pharaoh being shrewd, it's a clue to us that this is probably not the hero of the story. If the serpent was shrewd, then we see here that the Pharaoh is also uh, going to be a problem to us. Um, another part of this is talking about this Pharaoh who, uh, to whom Joseph meant nothing. And it's been about 400 years that uh, Joseph was in Egypt and he set up the whole system to protect the people of Egypt from the famine. Um, and all the nations of the world were coming to uh, Egypt to buy grain and Jacob's family came down to Egypt as well. And Joseph protected them, gave them the best land. Um, and so they continue to grow and grow and grow. Now this new dynasty has come, this new king, Pharaoh, who um, doesn't remember all the goodness of Joseph for the people and the people of Israel. And so it probably wasn't a direct line of all of the pharaohs throughout history, like coming to this point, there's probably dynasties that, a dynasty that rose up overthrew the other dynasty. And so then they don't hold the same cultural history um, as the uh, people of, uh, the, as the previous dynasty. So the Israelites are really just a problem now that needs to be solved for the current dynasty. Um, and so, he is telling them that we got we must deal shrewdly with them, um, and so they uh, develop a plan to um, to enslave them ultimately, and and so here are these people who the people of Israel who are um, numerous, they're powerful, they're influential, and we don't really know how. This is one of the questions that I have: How did these Israelites? become enslaved like did they volunteer i mean nobody volunteers to be a slave like in this way but like somehow they became enslaved um and so that's where we pick up in um verse 11 they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built pitham and ramses as store cities for pharaoh but the more they were oppressed the more they multiplied and spread so the egyptians came to dread the israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar, and with all kinds of work in the fields and all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So somehow they oppressed them. They gave them these terrible, terrible jobs. Brick making uh, in the ancient world was filthy and it was gross and it took a tremendous amount of, of work to do that, and this is happening at the time where Egypt is growing in um, in its building projects, uh, and you know, I, I one of the great blessings in the last several years is I have actually been able to go to Egypt, and it was awesome. Uh, it was crazy to go to a place where you know these stories happened, and to go and on a boat on the Nile River, and think like this is the river that you know, God eventually, he turns to blood in, in the book of Exodus. And there, so there's a lot of things that like kind of come alive there. One of the in, in most interesting things is when I went to go to the Sphinx, um, which is an amazing uh, feat that, that, and the fact that it still exists is really cool. Um, but you can look at the Sphinx and you see the craftsmanship and then turn around across the street is a pizza hut. And so there's a, there's a contrast of culture happening in Egypt even now. Um, but the, like the things like the pyramids, like these are tremendous building projects. And the Egyptian tour guide that uh, we went uh, on the bus with was talking about the pyramids. Um, and he said that the uh, pyramids were actually um, 
built by the farmers during the off season, um, which made me uh, made me laugh um, because <laughs> that doesn't seem like something farmers would do. First of all, I'm just like yeah, I'm going to go and do this terrible work, um, and so uh, yeah, so this idea of slaves building the the marvels of Egypt um, is something that Egyptian folks don't really want to talk about, um, but it here we have this example like these two cities the the israelites built it uh, built them and so um yeah so they are trying to oppress them but while they're oppressing them the israelites continue to flourish and they have even more kids um which is you know one of the interesting th themes throughout the uh throughout the bible and throughout the history of the church even is when there are seasons of oppression um or persecution God's people flourish, and uh, which is a comfort. Um, as a pastor, you know you you want things to not be hard for your people, but also you, like recognizing that in those hardships, God can do really wonderful things. He can continue to increase His community, um, but we don't go running after hardship and persecution. But we don't have to fear uh, fear persecution um, because. You know, we are not our own. We are bought with a price and we are pe the people of God. So their first plan is to enslave them. The Egyptians are first plan is to enslave the Israelites. It doesn't really work. So let's keep going. Verse 15, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were uh, Shifra and Hua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Uh, so this is, again, like a, another attempt to eliminate the people of Israel. And, and he, Pharaoh starts with the birth of baby boys because the baby boys are going to most likely be the way that the, the people are going to hold on to their identity as a nation because boys will carry on the family name um, and that, that kind of inheritance practicality. Whereas it letting the girls live, it, you know, these girls would become roped into the Egyptian men's lives and the families would be dramatically transformed um, in that way. And so here we have these two midwives who are uh, Hebrew women uh, who were probably like official midwives or leading midwives who uh, were, you know, there had to have been many, many more midwives than just these two, but they were, you know, examples of great heroism and how they did this we're not totally sure how they that saved all these women from having to have their their baby boys killed but they say like we hebrew women are just way faster at giving birth than egyptian women and like we can't get there in time and could it have been that these hebrew women knew that if the midwife got there in time then uh they would have to kill them. And so they just didn't call the midwives until they absolutely had to. Um, you know, some people, some commentaries even argued that the, um, the midwives just intentionally would not go to there. Some people do think there is some a genetic difference between the way that e Israelites and Egyptians gave birth. Um, but part of the culture though, like, you know, we see this picture of these birthing stools, which I don't understand how that works. Um, but 
the Egyptian culture could have been like the midwife is called right away, like as soon as labor starts, come and the, the midwife does most of the work. Whereas in the Hebrew culture, the midwife is there just at the end. There's a lot of like unknowns, but what we get here is that they are working to preserve the life of these boys. And, and so we see a blessing from the Lord is that they ended up having children, families of their own, which, uh, you know, we don't really, there's some confusion about, did these midwives just not generally have kids? How does that work? But pointing it out that the Lord gave them, gave them families of their own, like that is a, a blessing as they are trusting the Lord. And so the midwife plan didn't work. And so then Pharaoh gives the orders to all his people, throw the boys in the Nile. Um, and one of the thoughts behind why you would do that is the Nile was believed to be um, divine in its own way. And so by saying, let's just throw the boys in the Nile, they're really saying like, we're gonna let the gods determine what to do with these boys. We don't wanna be murderers, like we're not monsters. Um, so let's just throw these boys in the Nile and then let God decide, let our gods decide what to do with them. Um, and so like it, that's the next phase. And so the, the atrocity of this whole, exp like chapter one of Exodus is intense. Like they're trying to kill the people of Israel. Um, and we don't know how many of these boys did get thrown into the Nile. But we are told a story about one who was preserved. And so chapter two uh, starts with, um, with introducing us to Moses's family. Uh, two, one. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter sent down, uh, went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. Um, so I, we're introduced to Noah in the midst of this season of persecution for, for the people of Israel. And um, the, there's some interesting notes in the first couple of verses is the family has the baby and they need to keep him quiet and protect him. Nowhere in here are we given a name for this baby, for this boy. Um, like Moses' parents, you know, didn't name him, <laughs> which is unusual. So far when we've seen uh, baby boys named, we get their names right away. But here, uh, they didn't give him the name. And Moses is the youngest of three siblings that we know about. He has an older brother named Aaron and his sister here, who is um, Miriam. And they're going to be major figures in the history of the people of Israel uh, in the future for our history of the people of Israel. Um, and, uh, and so they have two kids already. Um, and now here is a third who is a fine child. And um, she, the mother, when she can't hide him any longer, puts him in a basket. And this basket is this is the same word that we use for Noah's ark. Um, it's, it's a little boat that she uses to, uh, 
put him on the Nile and, and not throw him into the Nile, like eat like Pharaoh commands the, uh, the people, but to put him on the Nile and, you know, trust, trust God to do something. And uh, for Miriam to follow along, you know, this is a, a pretty intense experience for a young girl. She's probably less than 12 years old. And she's watching her baby brother down the river, hiding in the, on the bank. Um, and the, the miracle of miracles is that Pharaoh's daughter comes down to bathe and the baby's crying and she goes and rescues him. And, uh, and Miriam is so resourceful. I love this. She's like, oh, hey, I see you found a baby. Would you like me to help you with that? This is a Hebrew baby. I know maybe some midwife or not midwives, but like a wet nurse who can help you raise this baby. And how does she know this, this potential wet nurse? Because it's the baby's mother. Uh, and like, so here God is uh, doing something very interesting in how he's bringing about uh, Moses onto the scene and protecting him and protecting his family because uh, Pharaoh's daughter agrees to everything Miriam suggests and then pays Moses's mother to raise her own child, which is pretty awesome, pretty good deal. Um, and so for years, uh, they were uh, in the house. Like Moses was raised by his mother before he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. And that's going to be important because he knows that he is a part of this uh, the Hebrew people. His mother would have told him, would have explained to him that, and even told him the stories of, of God's uh, saving work for Abraham and J uh, Isaac and Jacob. And, um, and so these are names and stories that he would have heard from his mother. But then he goes into Egypt uh, and is raised by Pharaoh, which is a, uh, it would have been a great education teaching him languages and how to write and read, uh, military strategy, diplomacy, all of these different things Moses would have learned. And if we look at the, the trajectory of Moses's life, uh, the first third of it really is in the formative stages going from ages zero to 40. And a lot of that is spent in Pharaoh's house. Um, and so as we are looking through all of these different things, we, after he goes back to Egypt's, or back to Pharaoh's mother, or Pharaoh's daughter, then he gets the name Moses, uh, in, in the, the way the narrative spells it out, um, and it means um, essentially to be born, so he's born of the water, um, to be drawn out of the water in that way, so um, yeah, and so here then the story jumps uh, 40 years in the future is the best estimate. So verse 11, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them and their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. So somehow Moses knows the Hebrews are his people and he knows the privilege that he has been given to be raised by Pharaoh in uh, in, you know, e Egyptian education, Egyptian power, all of these different things. So he has this position of privilege and he sees that the taskmaster is attacking and beating the, the Egyptian slave. So he kills him. And there are some things that, you know, we are told that, you know, hiding a body in Egypt uh, would be difficult because he just buries them in sand. Um, Whereas, you know, in the land of Israel, it's a lot rockier, more like traditional dirt. Uh, there might be an easier place to hide bodies. Uh, several commentaries made that note. Um, and so he's hiding, he hides the body. 
thinking he's gotten away with something, but then the, the Hebrews who fight amongst themselves uh, point out, hey, we know you killed a guy, so what's your deal? So he runs away uh, to the land of Midian, which is um, kind of an undetermined place. The Midianites were nomads, uh, but it would have been just you know to the northeast from Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula, most likely. Uh, that's where we're going to see the Mount, Mount Sinai um, is going to be in that region. And so, uh, yeah, so he's on the run and he's like, my life is over. I don't know what I'm going to do. He sits down by a well. Wells are important. A lot of interesting things happen by wells. Um, we saw several important wells in Abraham and Isaac's lives, uh, you know, even in the life of Jesus, John chapter four, he sits down by a well and talks with the Samaritan woman. Um, you know, wells are gathering places. They're important cultural hubs uh, for the people. It's kind of like, you know, even like a coffee shop today where all kinds of people are going to be there. Um, and, you know, in the future when we can sit in places again um, and enjoy coffee together. Like that's one of those cultural touchstone places that everybody goes. So he sits down by this well and his life may, seems to be over. So verse 16, now a priest of Midian had seven daughters and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away but Moses got up and came to the rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you returned so early today? They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Ruel asked his daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So we have a scene, this scene where these, the priest of Midian, Ruel, doesn't have any sons. That's why the daughters are the, the shepherdesses. Um, and this would not be something that daughters would normally do. And so the daughters are coming to the well. You know, in the previous, um, in the previous book, we saw that wells were often covered with a large stone because they wanted to protect it from uh, people who might try to poison the well. Uh, and so here, like that could be a similar situation where Moses is by the well. Um, and so the shepherdesses are being harassed by these other shepherds from a different family, drives them away. Uh, and maybe he uncovered the stone and, and then he started to give them all the water. And that's a ton of work um, to do, to get all the, to draw all the water and give enough for the flock. Uh, and Moses does it all for them. And Ruel is... Um, amazed by his generosity, his kindness, and invites him into his family. I have a sneeze coming. I'm sorry if it happens. Um, one of the things that we need to, we should note here is Ruel is one of the names that we get for Moses' father-in-law in the text. Uh, we will also see uh, Jethro will be something that we, well, he will be called an uh, Hobab. And so these different names, um, there are some, um, some theories for what these names could be. Ruel could be a family name. Jethro could be uh, an uncle's name. Like there's some different things that could be happening. Uh, with, and it could all just be one person with three names. It's a possibility as well. Um, so we first meet him as Ruel, uh, and his name means friend of God. And so he's a priest of Midian, which is not the elect people of, uh, of this story so far, but he is a friend of God. And when we will see him later on in the narrative, um, he will convert. It, it seems he converts to become a part of the community of God. 
um, in the ways of, of Israel, and he uh, will give Moses some advice on how to be a good leader. Um, so he brings Moses into his family. He marries off Zipporah to Moses. They have a kid. Like everything is moving along uh, in an encouraging way. And even his name, uh, Moses' name, uh, Gershom, uh, means uh, son of uh, or alien there. It just means like, I'm a foreigner. <laughs> this is my place. I'm a foreigner. Um, and so I, Moses is identifying his life in his son's life. Um, but something happens in verse 23. The king of Egypt died. The, the people of Israel are crying out to the Lord. Uh, and God hears and he remembers. And he starts stirring something up um, for, the, for the people of Israel. So what is he going to do? How is he going to stir this up? Um, he starts that journey in verse in chapter three and uh yeah let's go let's just go for it all right chapter three uh now moses was tending the flock of jethro there's jethro right ruel here's jethro his father-in-law the priest of midian and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to horeb the mountain of god now horeb and mount sinai um those are interchangeable names. Um, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight where the bush does not burn up. When the, the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here, am, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Okay, so um, Moses is doing the life of the shepherd. Like he's just out there. And he, he will spend 40 years um, essentially in exile uh, in Midian and shepherding Jethro's flocks. Um, as we uh, think about the life of a shepherd, it's a lot, there's a lot of loneliness, a lot of time away, um, but he would have been very familiar with the land. And so he's up on this mountain and all of a sudden seeing this fiery bush that's not burning, like that's unusual. And so he would have, I mean, it makes sense that he'd be like, well, I should go check that out. Um, and we are told here that the angel of the Lord, and that's literally translated messenger of Yahweh was in this bush. Um, and when we see the angel of the Lord in the Bible, um, one of the things that we should keep in mind is sometimes it is an angel, a messenger. Sometimes it is the uh, a theophany and an appearance of God. And, and the way this text it reads is like, that's what's happening here. The messenger of the Lord, um, the angel of the Lord is actually the presence of God and speaking God's words to Moses. Um, and as he is talking, he calls Moses over. Moses comes and, and then he says, um, you know, tells him to not come too close. It's not because he doesn't want to talk to him. It's because Moses is not fully aware of where he is. 
uh, it's like he does not recognize the holiness of this moment. And so he takes his shoes off, which is something that priests uh, would do in Egypt to take their, take their sandals off because it is holy ground. Uh, and so he tells him to take the shoes off. Moses would have recognized through his training uh, that this is a holy ground moment. Uh, and then he says, I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God that your mom told you about when she was raising you, like in the family stories, like this, I am that God. Uh, and so um, he goes on to say, like, this is my, my plan. I've heard of, your, of the people crying out, and I have come down to rescue them. The coming down of the Lord is a significant uh, uh, moment. Like he he hears enough and he comes and he is among his people. We will, uh, in, in John chapter one, the word becomes flesh and dwelled among us. Uh, he tabernacled among us. One of the key things that we see in Exodus is God wants to have a place with his people. And so this is the first we see that God is coming down to be with them. And Moses is overwhelmed when he recognizes who he's talking to. And he lays his face in the dirt, basically. Like, I am not worthy of being anywhere with you. Like, you are so holy and I'm so not. Um, but God starts revealing the plan. Like, I'm going to bring the people out and you, and I'm going to give them the land of the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Hittites. I'm going to give the land to, to the people, just like I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses' response is, who am I that I should do this? And um, the Lord tells him, like, look, you will know for sure that I'm, the one, I'm calling you to do this because when it happens, you're going to come back here and you're going to worship me with all of the people of Israel. So, um, yeah, this, he, Moses is doubtful. And we're going to see more of this doubtfulness from Moses um, in the next couple, uh, or the next couple of chapters as he's talking with God and trying to figure out who uh, he is and how he fits into God's divine plan. Um, but let's keep going in verse 13. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites. So he's not committing to anything. Suppose I do what you tell me to do uh, and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you and have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. The elders, elders of Israel will listen to you then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed toward this people so that when you leave, you will not go empty handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. All right. So we get this revelation of the divine name um, and, you know, names signify power. Um, the, the phrasing here, I am who I am, in Hebrew is, Aye, Asher, Aye. Um, I will be what I will be. Um, I guess truncated down to 
Yahweh um, is the shortening of that phrase. And this, uh, <clears throat> the name here should be understood as referring to Yahweh's being the creator, the sustainer, his power, uh, all that of all that exists, uh, both creation and history. Um, and also reminding us that he's active. I am, I am that I am. I will be what I will be. Uh, and he ties his name to the history of the people of Israel. Um, like just, they know who I am and remind them the stories, remind them of what God has done and help them to trust uh, the Lord together. And so he tells them to, tells Moses, go to the elders and tell them like the Lord is, has sent me and the elders will all agree together. And then they will go, you will all go to the Pharaoh and say, we want to take a three-day journey. And one of the interesting things is that this three-day journey is kind of an idiom to say, we want to just go out for an undetermined period of time to be, uh, to, to go and worship the Lord. And so um, when we see Pharaoh's resistance to the idea of a three-day journey to go and offer the Lord a sacrifice, Pharaoh knows that the three-day journey is not really a three-day journey. And he understands like, this is going to be you trying to leave. And if you leave, then I lose all my workforce. Um, and so, and God is telling Moses, all of this is what's going to happen, but God will then intervene with all the wonders of his power. And, um, you know, it is, we'll see how God uses this, the, the plagues, the 10 plagues to get uh, Pharaoh's attention and to transform the people of Egypt. But as you continue through here, God is telling him all of these things that are going to happen. And like, he's going to say like all the, the, the wonders that are going to happen will actually lead the people of Egypt to like be on your side in a way that they will, they will bless you as you go. So this, there's this concept of plundering the people of Egypt. Um, so it started with Moses's mom being paid by Pharaoh to raise this kid that should have been just thrown into the river. That was the first element of plundering Egypt uh, in the book here. Um, but then we see here, God is promising, like when you leave, you know, you, you'll just be able to ask the women and they will give you things of value. And like God is saying, I'm going to do this for you. So it's not just that God is going to um, overthrow the nation by power, because he can, but he's also going to transform the hearts of the common people of Egypt to bless the, the people with these gifts as they go. So let's stop there, and then we'll pick up in chapter four next week. But do y'all have any questions? Covered a lot of ground tonight. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear those and take some time to uh, respond or clarify on anything um, that we talked about. So thoughts. It was a lot, <laughs> so. All right, well, cool, nailed it. First three chapters, no questions. <laughs> I, guess it's an e I guess it's an easier read than Genesis. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, some of these stories so are- far. Yeah, th this is a story that like we've been told a bunch of times. Yeah. You know, if you've grown up in church, like this is something that you hear pretty regular. Whereas like not a lot of sermons on the Tower of Babel, not a lot of sermons on Judah and Tamar. You know, there's a lot of stuff in Genesis where it's like, let's just uh, skip that. Um, but here we're seeing like, no, this is, these are the stories that's like, yeah, look how awesome God is in the midst of all the crazy and the brokenness. God does some really cool stuff in the book of Exodus. Um, and here in the well, beginning- even even Hollywood has tackled these ones. So several times. Yeah. And some very well and others less well. Not, not <laughs> so, so well. 
one of my questions that I never really understood is why are we, why, why does ABC play the 10 commandments at Easter? I know like Passover is a part of the whole thing, but it's still, it's like Easter is more than Passover. So on Sun, Easter Sunday, you know, that's after Passover. Anyway, <laughs> it just, it just bothers me. Play it play an Easter movie. So but which Easter movie? <laughs> yeah. Which Easter movie? I don't know. Just play a Jesus movie, even like King of Kings, you know, like <laughs> it's not the, the best. Robe. The robe is really good. Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah ben or um yeah Ben Hur is closer <laughs> to yes. uh to the Easter story and like it's not overtly religious. Um so I don't know. I did, you know what, Jason, I did notice that God wasn't concerned with him marrying a Israelite woman. Um, yeah. So Moses marrying the Midianite. Yeah. Zipporah. Yeah. And that's actually going to be a situation in the, in the next couple of verse chapters, because um, there, there's a cultural clash between Moses uh Moses's heritage and Zipporah's heritage. And so we're going to see this situation where they're going back to Egypt and the angel of the Lord comes and tries to kill Moses. And so Zipporah circumcises Gershom and says, you have become a, a bridegroom of blood to me. And it's like, what is this story? <laughs> so um, yeah, so that'll be fun. Um, yeah, but there is one of the key things in, uh, in the promise to the to Abraham is that they will be a blessing to the nations. And so here we have this, this family that has the priest of Midian, Ruel, friend of God, um, or Jethro, you know, either name. Um, and so there's maybe some kind of peripheral understanding of L as God. That's, that is an echo to L the name of God, like, which means God, L of the people of Israel. So there could be some, like, some heritage sharing happening, but there are still some significant differences. Um, but yeah, again, but Moses is on the run. He's a, he's abandoning his, his family. He's abandoning his adopted family, his nation, his heritage. He's leaving it all um, because Pharaoh wants to kill him. And so Moses probably wasn't even thinking about who to marry at this point. So, but in marrying her, he's also bringing in the nations into the nation of Israel um, eventually. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, little hints of what God is doing in his grander scheme of redemption to bless the nations through the descendants of Abraham. So, yeah. But good, good point, um, Chris. Any other questions or thoughts? No? All right. Well, y'all, you have a great one. And so next week we're going to be looking at, I had it open. Um, let me see here. It's just so we are able to say so we're going to look at chapters four through seven seven four one through seven seven um so that will get us we'll continue on with this interaction with the lord at the uh at the burning bush um and moses will get some signs from the lord there uh, he'll head back to uh egypt um have that bridegroom of blood conversation with zipporah uh which will be fun um yeah. So cool. Well, you guys have a great week. Um, and yeah, if you're able to uh, join us on Sunday at 11 a.m. in person, uh, you can register at the creeksidechurch.org slash 11 a.m. And uh, yeah, it'd be great to see you all soon. Um, but yeah, have a great week and God bless. <laughs>